So Don Webster, he's a principal agent, and he um, is a regional specialist. He works for the University of Maryland Extension at the Y, Wert, y Research and Education Center that's based right here in Queen Anne's County, in Queenstown. His programs advance commercial and the restoration of aquaculture with main thrust to rebuild Maryland seafood resources and expand commercial production by supporting research and working to minimize legal and regulatory barriers uh, to profitable businesses. Hmm, Don, I think we do a lot of the same things. Um, he is an appointed member of the Maryland Aquaculture Coordinating Council, which reports to the governor and to the legislature. He's on the board of directors of Chesapeake Agriculture Innovation Center. He's a member of the Technical and Industry Advisory Committee of the USDA-funded Northeast Regional Aquaculture Center. And he is really, this is important for us that work at the university, he's the first faculty member for our college and for extension to be elected as a chair of the Univers University of Maryland Accent of Senate, which is really a big deal. But I asked Don to uh, come and talk. We do a lot of programs together, and he was really very, uh, when we talked about starting ag awareness, we were like, okay, what are we going to incorporate? And of course, aquaculture is very important for, for what we do, and he helped um, put that part of our ag awareness together. But anyway, today he is going to talk to us about my farm is underwater. So Don, thank you. Thank you very much. I really appreciate being here. This has always been one of my favorite programs, frankly. Uh, it's great to see uh, so many wonderful people here, uh, friends. I made some new ones today. Uh, this has always been a program with great people in a great county celebrating Maryland's greatest industry. And uh, if I had my way, we would have a big banner over the eastbound span of the bridge at the Kent shoreline that said very simply, welcome to the eastern shore. We feed people. This is a great industry, folks. Um, I gave Jenny this title because I figured it would confuse a lot of folks. And I could see some of them sitting there going, what's he going to talk about when I got my combine stuck in a ditch? Maybe he's one of them global warming people who's going to tell me I got to move to Appalachia in about two years. Not really. This title comes from Somebody that I worked with years ago, one of the great parts of Extension are the fantastic people that you get to work with during the course of your career. Um, one of my favorites was a gentleman named Max Chambers. That is Max with the knit cap on. Uh, in the years Max and I worked together, we found out a lot of things about each other, including we had served in the Army at the same time. We'd been at, stationed at the same place in Vietnam, but at different times. Um, but Max was great to work with. Um, Max was, how should I put this, one of the world's premier recyclers. If you had something you wanted to get rid of, you could call Max and he would take it. And he would probably figure out something to do with it. One of the people called Max and said, I've got a couple old shanties here I'm trying to get rid of. Can you use them? So Max went and took them and he turned them into a small oyster hatchery down in Nanticoke in Wacomico County. And we used to joke about it and say, if you went down there and you kicked the broomstick out, it would probably just fall into the bay. But it was quite successful. He did a lot with it. And he had this great sign on it that read very simply, this is not a government operation. If it was, I'd have twice as nice facilities, but only one half the production. <laughs> That was Max. I mean, he was, he was wonderful to, uh, to talk with. So I had an assistant director call me one day and say, are you going to be in your office? I need to tell you a story. And he came by with a big grin on his face, and he said, I'm coming from the Maryland Farm Bureau meeting in Ocean City. Max had later on moved to Somerset County, built a larger and more um, com complex uh, oyster hatchery. And he was elected president of Somerset County Farm Bureau, and he was on National Farm Bureau Aquaculture Committee. <clears throat> but my assistant director showed up, and he said, I'm coming from the Maryland Farm Bureau meeting in Ocean City. He said, the meeting this morning was general business meeting. He says, the audience, room full of people. He said, and they're kind of halfway listening to what's going on, and people are talking among themselves in little groups. He said, your friend Max got up, who was recognized, and introduced himself. And he said, 
I'm a farmer too, but my farm's underwater. And immediately you could see people go, what did he say? And turn around and focused on him, and he ended up getting two resolutions passed by Farm Bureau. Uh, that was Max. But we agreed with the same thing. Aquaculture is agriculture. Interesting, the United States is the only major nation in the world that does not include aquaculture and commercial fisheries in its National Agriculture Agency. Ours is basically in NOAA, a science agency, in commerce, a business department. But USDA does do a lot for it, and some of which I'm going to show you here today. <coughs> this Monday, I will be with University of Maryland Extension for 49 years. So I'm kind of mid-career and really need to get moving to see things happen. Uh, thank you. I'd, I'd be giving, a, I'd be giving a applause to the, to the university and, and uh, land grant system because it's been a great run, absolutely great run. Um, we've worked with a range of things over the years I've been here. We did a lot of work with hard clams over in the coastal bays with the salinities high and they can be raised. Uh, soft shell crab recirculating systems where instead of being down on the bay, you can actually shed crabs in a garage, a commercial waterman, <coughs> that cuts mortality, lengthens your season, increased profitability. We worked a lot, a lot of the work with um, commercializing rockfish and their hybrids were done here in Maryland. Uh, with my colleague Reggie Harrell. Uh, most of that, we had some large farms here. Most of the industry has now moved down south, but uh, we did a lot of the work here. Uh, I had a colleague in southern Maryland who worked with some catfish farmers down there. Uh, some of you may remember Bruce Nichols, who used to be a soil conservation down in Wacomico County, who had, who got people grazing crawfish here on the shore and in Virginia and, and Delaware. Um, there's not much right now, but we actually had a Mid-Atlantic Crawfish Association that had these great t-shirts, had a big crawfish on the back with their title, and the slogan, the tail is best, you can suck the rest, which is how they, how they eat them. Some people do. And, uh, we've worked with tilapia. We had about 20 systems in those over the years and have very uh, aquatic plants. We've done a lot with those. In fact, using them to uh, uh, cut the weed, weed problems in uh, farm ponds. But the biggest one we've worked with all these years has been oysters. And um, this is what uh, the oyster industry, the resource in Maryland from 1840 to 2000. I've separated three eras. Era one was from 1840 to about 1930. Um, we had three-dimensional reefs in the bay. They had existed for thousands of years. The indigenous populations used them. They taught our colonists how to make dugout canoes, how to use uh, some early harvest gear. But New Englanders wiped their oysters out uh, early 1800s, and they looked down here and saw this oyster gold mine. And they brought the toad oyster dredge down here. It coincided with canning technology, early refrigeration, and the big one was expansion of the railroads to the west that opened vast new markets for products. And it led to this gold rush for oysters down here with people taking what they wanted, when they wanted, where they wanted. Eventually led to the oyster wars of the Chesapeake and the creation of Maryland's Oyster Navy, which is today's Natural Resources Police Force. Um, we had scientists like uh, William Brooks at Johns Hopkins warning about overharvest. Uh, nobody listened much to him, and after 1885, when we peaked at 15 million bushel harvest, we saw a big fall off in, back into the second era, about 50 years from 1930s to the 1980s, where our harvest in Maryland ran about two and a half, three million bushels a year. When I started working, we had 44 shucking plants actually operating in Maryland, several thousand harvesters on the bay. Um, but in the 1960s, two diseases moved in, MSX from the Pacific Northwest, Dermo from the uh, Gulf Coast, that basically took the coastal areas out of the, out of the resource, knocked Virginia out of the market. Virginia always out-harvested Maryland, and uh, got up here a little bit, but then sort of moderated. But in moving oysters around the bay and trying to rebuild the industry, we moved diseased seed with them. And it led to this crash when we had several years of drought in the 1980s that we're still trying to build back from. Um, the two different states went two different directions. Virginia always went in the direction of leasing portions of their bay for people to raise oysters. Um, they still have 140,000 acres that are under lease, only about 30,000 are actually used. But they always out-harvested Maryland. About 80% of their harvest came from uh, private leases. Maryland watermen hated leasing. 
They fought against it for 150 years and uh, put all sorts of uh, laws and regulations on the books that kept it from really being very large in this state, other than Nanticoke in Wacomico County, which was the home of one of the largest oyster companies in the United States, the H.B. Kennerly Company. And the Kennerleys had talked almost all the watermen down there into getting leases. I have a lease chart from 1961 of that area, and everything in the Nanticoke is, is leased. And it was one of the reasons why that company was able to ship oysters 12 months a year. They had the Kroger food chain contract for the entire Midwest uh, up, until, uh, up until they sold and the, and the resource died. Um, in 2008, uh, um, the uh, Secretary of House Resources, John Griffin, is the top picture of the second gentleman in there. It was probably the best DNR secretary I've ever worked with. John convinced Governor O'Malley we needed to change our leasing program. And we worked very heavily to do that, and it passed unanimously, both houses of the legislature. Never thought I'd see that. And then uh, we took another year to roll that into a comprehensive management plan. That was the uh, press conference there announcing that started taking new applications in September 2010. We have almost 8,000 acres now in Maryland that are under lease. We have an active use program. You're going to lease it to public resource belongs to all of you, as well as it does to the leaseholder. So if you're going to lease it, you have to use it. Um, University Extension, we create an oyster team of all the state agencies, uh, agriculture, natural resources, health department, environment, state, federal agencies, uh, NGOs. Um, we're able to do a lot of training programs. We were doing 15 to 25 training programs a year, getting people uh, the skills they needed for this industry. What's made oyster aquaculture a very a very doable industry that could be expanded. There are things like hatcheries now. You don't have to rely strictly on natural reproduction. The Horn Point Hatchery that's down in Cambridge, the university has been operating since the 70s, um, is one of the largest in the country. They bring oysters in, they start to condition them in early January, tricking them into believing spring's coming early. They start spawning in April. So you've got uh, larvae coming out. The uh, You can see the, the um, uh, spawning tanks, uh, they take care of the larvae, go through about two to three weeks where they actually free swim in the water before they metamorphose and become true oysters. Uh, they feed them, they create phytoplankton that goes to feed the animals in the tanks. Uh, at the end of that time, you have what are called eyed larvae. These are oysters that are ready to, to set. And you can actually ship those to people. You can drain them down, keep them cool, and they can be shipped to growers. We've also had a lot of work done on breeding for disease-resistant lines, like agriculture, better yield, disease resistance. Uh, my colleague Stan Allen retired a few years ago from Virginia Sea Marine Science, spent 30 years of his career doing this. We have several lines of oysters now that are disease-resistant and optimized for different salinities in the bay. Uh, this is what corn was like over the, uh, over the generations, and Stan reckoned that this is about where we were with oysters, but still more to be done. So you've got a lot of things that are out there that we can use. My colleague Don Merritt, who retired a few years ago, brought the concept of remote setting back from the Pacific Northwest. And this is where growers can put tanks in um, and put uh, aged shell containerized in the tanks, put water in, put eyed larvae into it. The, uh, they set on those. We, uh, we do uh, annual training programs for uh, growers in that, showing them how it works. Um, and then we actually have 38 systems that we've had around the bay from St. Mary's <coughs> County down through Crisfield that growers could use on a two-week basis uh, and use uh, hatchery larvae in them. This has been a very successful program over the years. We have two different types of leases in Maryland. Um, one is water column leases. This is where you take those larvae, you set them on little minute grains of shell chips, and it creates a single oyster. Uh, it'll look like a, like a fingernail. Um, if you put those oysters on the bottom, you would get zero back. Um, crabs and other organisms eat them like bar peanuts. It's been tried. Uh, but if you put them in containers and protect them, you'll grow. Basically, these are the oysters that go to the raw bars and the restaurants, high value oysters. They have to, but there's a lot of labor involved with it. You've got to keep that gear clean. Anybody who's got a boat knows what happens when you put it in the water in summer. You've got biofouling on it. Uh, you've got to continually keep those clean because you can't use anti-fouling paints on stuff that's going to be 
<coughs> oysters that are going to be uh, consumed. Um, this is what bottom cages look like. Uh, they, they go down on the bottom. This is what a, a leaf looks like from a drone. It's actually you know, quite a bit of space that's still left in there. <coughs> we have surface floats. These are uh, Canadian oyster grows. Um, some of the companies using those actually on the bay in some very high energy areas. And then these are midwater containers that came to us from uh, uh, Australia. So all this type, these are oysters, I said, that are going to raw bars and restaurants. They brought, bring them out periodically, tumble them to knock the bills off to make them grow round and deep. Most of these have to get a higher price because there's a lot of labor involved with them. <coughs> One of the things that's really interested me is some of the, the innovative branding that they use for these. Um, there's companies that may have two or three brands for oysters depending on their sizes. My favorite was, uh, unfortunately, the late uh, um, Tim Devine, who had Barron Island Oyster Company in Dorchester County. He used to take his oysters that were kind of smaller, misshapen, and he used to sell them as ugly oysters. And the slogan on the box read, they have great personalities. <laughs> Key to marketing. The biggest amount of production that has always been there, and this is a, a bottom culture, and this emulates natural oyster reefs. Um, it requires shell as a base. You have to put a base of shell down, and then you would take your, your setting tank. Some of the guys we have are, have some really large units now. This is one that takes about 500 bushels of shell. Uh, you put shell in there in containers. You put your larvae in, circulate it, and you get the spat on shell, which is then taken out, planted on your lease. Uh, you monitor it over time and then uh, harvest it when you come to market size. Um, one of the things we have is side scan sonar. You know, where do I put a lease? Side scan sonar can help you with that. And we have uh, operations that can do this that will go out and look and see what the bottom is like so that you can find the best bottom to locate your lease. This is um, one down this northern uh, Tangier Sound. Uh, you can see the traditional soil map for a farm, and this is a sonar map for an oyster farm. You can see there's cults, mud, uh, sand, different areas. And, you know, if you plant those, if you look at those, if you use that bottom lease, you have very little that's plantable. 90% you, you would have a good deal. You've got to do that because of um, the survival. If you put these in mud, go and plant, you're going to get nothing back. It'll just uh, go right into the bottom. Um, as you all know, in agriculture, the USDA said ag mechanization is listed as one of the 20 modern transformational achievements in this country. How many of you now use drones to go out and survey fields, show you where the stress points are, uh, help you with management, agricultural harvesting and planting equipment that is highly computerized? Uh, in our, uh, shellfish aquaculture, we're uh, somewhere between Amish horse drone implements and a 1950 tractor. There's a lot of work that needs to be done with this. Um, several years ago, one of the benefits to working with the university are the tremendous people that you interact with. And uh, several years ago, I was asked to come to the Clark Engineering College and give a talk to the robotics center crew up there on aquaculture. Did the broad scheme, shellfish, finfish, uh, land-based, uh, bay-wide, offshore. And uh, we had a really great discussion. And they called the next day, and I highlighted the oyster uh, problems that we had and the technology needs. And they called the next day and said, would you be interested in working as a team to find uh, money and uh, develop a project? And surely, glad to. So what developed from that was what has become S3AM, the Smart Sustainable Shellfish Aquaculture Management Program, which USDA has funded for a five-year, $10 million project. We've got a great team that's together on this. Uh, the top is the uh, engineers from at College Park, Matt Gray, who's uh, with the University down at Horn Point. Uh, covers all coasts, all three coasts. Bobby Hudson, uh, Executive Director, Pacific Shellfish Institute. Megan Jima from uh, Southern Louisiana. Uh, Jonathan Van Senten is an economist with Virginia Tech. Adam Porter is with uh, Fraunhofer, who does uh, uh, software engineering. It's our extension team at the bottom. Uh, Willie Lance, who's uh, the head of uh, one heads of a 4-H program in Maryland, and then John uh, Wei Jin, who works with UMES. So it combines all of these together in this project uh, that will take in all three coasts. Um, the concept was to bring together engineers, 
scientists, economists, extension faculty, and stakeholders look at the problems, which is what extension does well, and help work with them to help develop solutions and get this technology out into the industry. And this is where we've been going. Um, the project is uh, first to do uh, drone-based monitoring, and then uh, we've got several other projects involved with that. Look at start off in the labs, take them out into the wild, all three coasts, try them out. Um, do the economic assessment. If you're not in aquaculture to make money, it's a really expensive hobby. Um, and then we've got um, both undergraduate work, a great 4-H program that's part of this, and then building a national network that can help uh, uh, bring this out there. You've planted your bottom lease. How do you tell what it looks like? How do you tell what's happening on it? Right now, there's only a few ways. You can use these hydraulic patent tongs. You go to Ocean City in the summer, go to Boardwalk, and you got the little, put a quarter in, you got the thing that goes down, look for a toy. That's kind of what that is. It's, uh, it's a, a commercial method of, of harvest in Maryland. It takes about a meter square dip at a time. That's pretty accurate. You can put divers down with a transect line, quadrats, take samples. Both of these are expensive and time consuming. What most folk use is the toad oyster dredge, which is one of the most abominable pieces of equipment we've ever brought down here. Um, we know from research it kills a lot of small oysters and it tears up the important bottom substrate. I had one of the growers I was working with and we were talking about this. This is one of the things we got to come up with better ways. He goes, I dredge pretty good piece of equipment. I said, I've been to your home. It's beautiful. You don't have an outhouse for sanitary purposes. Your wife doesn't have a hand pump in the kitchen and she's not cooking on a wood stove. That's 1830s technology. That's when the dredge came down here. Furthermore, how big is it? 36 inches. Why? Because that's what the legislature told the sailboats they could use in the last century. You know, if you've got a three, 400 horsepower boat towing that thing, it makes as much sense as you guys planting the grain fields of the Eastern Shore with the walk behind rototillers. There's no sense in it. We've got to come up with better ways to do things. One of the things we're looking at now is drone monitoring. Uh, yeah, you can do it in the air. It's not bad. How do you do it underwater? Visibility is not too good in the bay. So this is one of the first things that we are working on. Uh, how do you take a drone, put it underwater, know exactly where it is, program it to go back and forth on a lease, and give you all the data from that? Uh, this is the current concept on that where there would be a, a vessel, uh, probably a, a pre-programmed drone at the surface, and then it would be communicating with the underwater drone, which would be taking, uh, taking data on the actual uh, oyster population. Um, there's a lot of drones that are available on the market, but not a whole lot of them actually have the type of um, uh, equipment that we need to be able to do this work on uh, oyster reefs. So um, we are working on that. These are things like bringing cameras in, uh, looking at uh, RGB images, um, how to determine. How many live oysters you have? What are their sizes? What areas you have of potential mortality? Generate the popular dynamics, population dynamics, and then aid in your lease planning, harvest, and maintenance. Um, you know, how, to, how to acquire those images. This is some of the uh, work we've been doing. This is with uh, one of the growers down in, in Talbot County that we've been working a lot with. Um, and then the oyster data set we've been working from, from tanks uh, Horn Point actually has what's called a sail lab, shellfish aquaculture innovation lab, which are tanks which they can set up to do some of the work inside and then take it out in the bay and actually give it a trial so you can tell what oysters look like and try to come up with the, uh, uh, the data. Uh, one of the things that we have as part of that SDRM program is 4-H, one of the great programs of all time. Maryland already has one of the you know, uh, nationwide greatest uh, robotics uh, programs in the state. We're taking it underwater with this pro program. Um, I'm really, really interested in seeing the kids work with this. One of the things I would love to see is 4-H uh, clubs with their own oyster leases. The only one I've ever found in the United States was in the Pacific Northwest in the state of Washington. Uh, it was called Big Quill Enterprises. They were hooked up with uh, Taylor Shellfish. The kids raised oysters. <coughs> and then took them to the farmer's markets and sold them. So they got the experience of raising them as well as the sales and marketing. Um, 
And that extension links those parts together. My, me and my, uh, my colleagues and I, uh, we did some of the first work out in the field, taking the engineers out, one of our growers in Talbot County. Uh, we've worked with them down there at the same place to uh, put some of this gear together. We've done uh, conferences. This was seed to dollar sign that we did this uh, past March over at the uh, Bay Foundation. It was after the National Shell Fisheries Association conference in Baltimore, so we had people from all over the country. And then uh, we've had students down at the Y playing with the robots. They love they love playing with the uh, the robots. And then uh, uh, the uh, Maryland Waterman Show in Ocean City every year. So we've done quite a lot with that. The next area we've looked at is um, a water quality monitoring program where you could have sons that would be placed. Our idea is you could every lease has to have four corner markers on it. And the thought is that you could put a sond on the corner of each one of our leases that would measure temperature, chlorophyll, pH, salinity, uh, and uh, send that back to a central source, and you can pick it up on a notebook computer and see what was happening both in the bay, in your tributary, and down to your lease. Um, most of the leaseholders I've talked about this, we're very excited about seeing something like this happen. One of the biggest ones in the future is harvesting. As I told you, I am not a big fan of the, uh, the toad oyster dredge. Um, what do you come up with? Th this is one that the engineers put together first. I kind of refer to that as R2D2 in little white boots. Um, you know, we, we've got to come up with something a little bit, a little bit better than that. But um, <clears throat> interesting concept. These are some of the things that have been developed to, uh, to harvest uh, like minerals in the open ocean. We're not going to use something like this on a lease, but Virginia Institute of Marine Science put together a, a deal years ago. I was on the boat, late, late 70s. They took a, a, a hydraulic clam rig, took the hydraulic manifold off it, so you weren't digging a foot deep trench in the bottom, and replaced it with a series of rotating tines, like a soybean combine. It would go down, it would rake the oysters up, put them on that movable belt, they would come up, you'd take off what you wanted, the rest would go back overboard, back down on the bottom. I think something like this may have some real potential here, but not two feet wide. I'm thinking more eight, ten feet wide with specially designed vessels where you could really pull stuff in. Um, so how to combine those technologies, this is where we're going with the, with the whole process and hopefully come up with things that will move us uh, strongly into the, uh, uh, into the 21st century. This is my vision and I use the poultry industry model here. I grew up in northern New Jersey in the post-World War II baby. I saw, I heard the early um, ads from Purdue, from Frank Purdue, who sounded like a chicken. He was great on radio, a radio ad. But I remember my mother taking me to butcher shops and seeing, you know, whole chickens hanging up by their feet. And when the poultry industry started, you started to see branding. You started to see really great product coming on the market. Um, from the time I've been down here, I've seen the uh, production time go from 14 weeks to seven weeks, you know, much better. We could do this with oysters, and this is my view on this thing, my goal. I'd like to see us with 50 to 100,000 acres in Maryland in active oyster production and then keep growing. We have the ground to do that with. Target initial harvest of 500 to 1,000 bushels per acre on a three to four year cycle, very doable. This is what the Kennerly Company used to do, 1,000 bushels to the acre on about a four-year cycle. It's very doable. Create modern processing methods for meat extraction. You're not going to find people stand there for eight hours a day and stick a knife in oysters in the future. We have methods like high-pressure processing that puts the oysters under extremely high pressure, dissolves the protein that holds the adductor muscle that clamps the shell. When you release it, the shell's open, and you can actually pour the meats out of them. One of the problems with that technology right now is if you put those meats in you know, glass containers and sell them like our industry does, they discolor after a period of time. So you don't have the shelf life. However, if you took those same oysters, breaded them, froze them, you open vast new markets of high volume retailers, Costco, Walmart, fast food outlets. So I keep telling my growers, I want to see Wendy's and Popeye's and Burger King fighting over who's got the best oyster sandwich. I want to see Chick-fil-A in competition with Oysters Are Us across the street from them. And I think that can be done and then uh, keep building from there. What do you get from that? Well, the more oysters you can shuck and get the meats out and keep the shell, the more shell you have to build those grounds. The high biofiltration that comes from those oysters. 
will help remove nutrients, increase underwater visibility. Maryland Agriculture has done a tremendous job in nutrient reduction into the bay. This is another area that could help it tremendously. We actually have a program in Maryland that can pay oyster growers for the value of the nutrients their oysters remove. And that could continue and, and become better. Um, and extend our SAV beds, make the bay better. Uh, and the benefits to, to the bay, uh, as we have on all of our programs for oyster aquaculture, three big words on the cover. Economy, employment, environment. This is an industry that helps all three. So, Thank you very much on behalf of myself, my partner, Matt Parker, who's uh, my aquaculture business specialist, best in the United States. Uh, Kathy Liu is our seafood technology specialist. Brittany Wolf Bryant uh, works for us. She's actually with Morgan State. She runs their hatchery. She's been doing a lot of work with uh, soft shell clam aquaculture. But, uh, anyway, thank you very much, and we're there for you. <laughs>